very meaningful words. Amen. Don't you love the music that was composed for the first pillars? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father and our God, we're going to study the foundational truth that has made us what we are as a people. And we just ask that the Holy Spirit, through the ministration of your angels, will be present in this place to give us understanding, not only intellectually, but also experientially that we might experience salvation as it is revealed in the sanctuary. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of approaching your throne with the assurance that you hear us. And we know that you will answer this prayer because we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. At the general conference session last year, we heard an impassioned plea by our new general conference president, Elder Ted Wilson, in a kind and yet firm tone, he spoke about the unique relevance of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and the dangers of losing our self-identity. Why does the Seventh-day Adventist Church exist? What makes us unique? Should we be preaching what other churches are preaching? Or do we have a distincti distinctively unique message for this time? I believe the answer to these questions is found in an understanding of the ministration of Christ in the sanctuary. In fact, we find in the book, Counsels to the Church, page 347, written by Ellen White, these very significant words. The correct understanding, notice the correct understanding, of the ministration in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. Now as we look at the sanctuary, I believe that the sanctuary reveals five stages in the work of Christ for our salvation. The first stage takes place in the camp. We usually begin our study of the sanctuary in the court. But the sanctuary begins in the camp where sinners are, needy sinners. And so Jesus came to this earth and he came to dwell among us and to face all of our temptations and all of our trials and never to sin, not even once. Because Jesus not only came to live with us, Jesus came to live for us. He came to live in our place. He came to live the life that we should live. You see, the law of God demands absolute perfection. You cannot deviate from the law, which is a reflection of the character of God, one iota. And none of us can offer the law that perfection. And so we needed Jesus to come to this earth to live the perfect life that God requires from us. And then, of course, we move into the second part of the sanctuary, which is the court. In the court, we find the main piece of furniture, the altar of sacrifice. That is where Jesus died for us. You see, not, it wasn't sufficient for Jesus to live the life we should live because the law also condemned us to death because we're all sinners. And so somebody had to come and pay the penalty for our sins. And so at the altar of sacrifice in the court, Jesus dies paying the penalty for every person who has ever lived on planet earth. The work that Jesus did in the camp and in the court is corporate. In other words, it was done for every person who has ever lived on planet earth. He lived his life for all. And he died his death for all. And then he resurrected at the labor. It's called the labor of regeneration in Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. 
And then he enters upon the third stage of his work of salvation, which takes place in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. There Jesus applies the benefits of his earthly work to people who come to him in repentance confessing their sins and trusting in his merits. You see the resources are there but the resources must be individually claimed. On earth Jesus gained the benefits of salvation, a perfect life and a death for sin, but those must be personally and individually claimed in order for us to benefit from what Jesus did. And so in the holy place Jesus receives prayers of repentant sinners who confess their sins and say, Jesus, I trust your merits. I trust in your life. I trust that you can take your life and your death and put them to my account. Thank you, Jesus. Please accept me. And Jesus then takes his perfect life and he takes his death for sin and he places them to my account. And God looks upon me as if I had never sinned. That's the work that Jesus performs in the holy place. And so our sins enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. And some people say, well that's a threat to our salvation. For if our sins enter the sanctuary and they're written in the sanctuary, they're against us. I beg to differ. You see, if your sins do not enter into the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, they are here. You don't have to worry about your sins being in the sanctuary as long as they enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. What is written in heaven is forgiven sins. They are not sins that will be held against you. But nevertheless, our sins are recorded in the books. And next to the books is written when we confess our sins, when we repent, when we come to Jesus and trust in his merits, next to those sins Jesus writes, forgiven. And then of course we have the fourth phase of the work of Jesus. And this is where uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is unique. You see we believe that all of those sins that have entered the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus must be cleansed from the sanctuary. And that takes place during the Day of Atonement. The purpose of the Day of Atonement as we're going to see is to reveal before the universe who was a true believer and who was not. In other words, the purpose of opening up the books and revealing the records is to show who truly repented, who truly confessed sin, and who truly trusted in the merits of Jesus, which is shown by a changed life. And once the sanctuary is cleansed from all forgiven sins, they are placed on the head of the scapegoat, Azazel. And then Jesus changes his garments from his high priestly garments to his kingly robes. And he returns to earth as king of kings and lord of lords. And that is stage number five. I once had somebody say to me, Pastor Bohr, True, Ellen White says that Jesus is going to change his garments from his high priestly garments to his kingly garments. Where do you find that in the Bible? And I looked at him, I, know that, I knew that his question was not a sincere question. It was a loaded question because he didn't believe in the writings of Ellen White. And so I looked at him and in my uh, normal diplomatic way <laughs> I said, if you just used a little of the gray matter that God has given you, <laughs> you would be able to figure it out. And he looked at me with surprise and I said, let me tell you where it is in the Bible. How is Jesus clothed today? He says, well, he's serving as high priest, so he's clothed as a high priest. I said, good answer. I said, when Jesus comes again, how is he clothed? Oh, now he knew he was up a creek without a paddle. He says, well, in Revelation 19, it says that he comes clothed as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So I said, the inevitable conclusion is that before he came, he changed.
It's simple. What Ellen White says is found in Scripture if you look hard enough. The trouble is we are lazy Bible students. We are not in-depth Bible students. And so we have these five stages of the work of Christ. Now I would like to ask this question and we're going to dedicate the rest of our time to answer this question. Before that let me make a statement. Would you agree that all of these statements, all of these phases of Christ's ministry are truth? No doubt about it. All of these stages are truth. But let me ask you, are all of these stages of the work of Christ present truth? No. You say, no, wait a minute. All these stages are not present truth? Do you want to know what present truth is? It's very simple. If you want to know what present truth is, all you have to do is find out where Jesus is and what he's doing now. And that's what we should be preaching. Now don't misunderstand me, the, the perfect life of Christ is indispensable. His death on the cross is indispensable. His ministration of receiving sins in the sanctuary is indispensable. But present truth has to do with the apartment where Jesus is ministering today. What is he doing today? And what are the truths revealed there where Jesus is? And let me ask you, where is Jesus? He is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, which means that present truth in order for us to preach present truth, it must be the truths that are revealed where? That are revealed in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Are you with me? Yeah. I'd like, I take, I'd like to take our minds to the book of Revelation. I want us to take a look at Revelation's seven churches. Now most conservative Bible scholars believe that the seven churches represent seven periods of church history. In fact most of them, even Hal Lindsey who is a dyed-in-the-wool futurist who believes in the rapture and the reestablishment of Israel and the rebuilding of the temple and all of those things even he says that the seven churches represent seven stages of church history and this is the way they look at it. The church of Ephesus is the apostolic church. The church of Smyrna is the church that was persecuted under the Roman emperors. The third church, Pergamum, is the church when compromise comes into the church in the days of Constantine the Great. The church of Thyatira, where that woman Jezebel does her work, that harlot woman, represents the period of the Middle Ages, the dominion of the Roman Catholic Papacy. The church of Sardis represents the period of the Protestant Reformation. In other words, the first five churches take us to the period after the Protestant Reformation and the period of papal supremacy. Now I would like, like to take a look at the sixth church in the series. Remember that according to Adventist and non-Adventist conservative scholars, the sixth church would come after the period of papal supremacy and after the period of the Protestant Reformation. Now I want you to notice church number six. It's called Philadelphia. Let me ask you this question. Would church number six be a period before the second coming of Christ? It would have to be because after the sixth church there is a seventh. And you can't have a seventh church if Jesus came during the sixth church. And so the period of the sixth church is sometime after the fall of the papacy in 1798 but before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Interestingly enough the word Laodicea which is the very next church means judging the people. So the church after the church of Philadelphia is the church of the what? Is the church of the judgment. Interestingly enough. Now I'd like us to read from Revelation chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8 something very interesting that is placed before the church of Philadelphia. The sixth church before the second coming of Christ but after the year 1798. 
It says here, and to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts, and shuts and no one opens. So there's a key and something is going to be shut and something is going to be what? Open. Now what is it that's going to be shut and what is going to be open? Verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set before you a what? An open door and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. So what is placed before the church of Philadelphia? The church before the second coming, but after the period of papal supremacy? An open door. Interesting. How many doors does the sanctuary have? Actually the door had three. The sanctuary had three. The first door led from the camp to the court. The second door led from the court to the holy place and the third door led from the holy to the most holy place. Now the question is, which of these doors was opened before Philadelphia? It cannot be the door to the court. Because Philadelphia is church number six. And Jesus came to the court even before the church age. Are you understanding me or not? It cannot be the second door, the door that leads into the holy place, because Jesus opened that door and entered the holy place when he ascended to heaven. And we've talked about that in my first two presentations. So it can't be the first door, because the first door is the door to the court and the work of the court Jesus did on earth when he died on the cross. It can't be the second door, the door to the holy place, because that door was open when Jesus ascended and began his high priestly ministry in the holy place. So how many doors does that leave? It only leaves one door. door the door of the sixth church after 1798. Now the question is where does this door lead to? We've noticed that it leads to the most holy place, but now let's prove it from scripture. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. Revelation chapter 11 and verse 19. This verse is in the context of the sixth trumpet. Interesting. You have the sixth church and you have the open door. Now you have the sixth trumpet and you're going to notice also an open door. It says there in Revelation 11 verse 19, Then the temple of God was opened in heaven, which means that it must have been what? It must have been closed until then. So it says, the temple of God was opened in heaven, and where does this door of the temple lead to? It says, and the ark of his covenant was what? The ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Which temple is this, the earthly or the heavenly? It's the heavenly temple. Which door is this? To which apartment? To the most holy place. How do we know that? The word temple here is the word naos. It is used 15 times in Revelation. Every single time it refers to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Not only that, but the text itself tells us that the temple was open in heaven and what was seen? The Ark of the Covenant. Now here's my question. On which day of the Hebrew year was the most holy place opened and the Ark of the Covenant seen? It was on the Day of Atonement. So under the sixth trumpet, under the sixth church, you have an opening of a door, and that door leads to the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is found. Are you with me? This gives us the chronology of the judgment. Now I'd like to remind us about Daniel 7, because Daniel 7 follows the same pattern, the same chronology. I can only review this. I'm sure that many of you, probably most of you, have studied Daniel chapter 7. We have a lion. What does the lion represent? The kingdom of Babylon. Then we have a bear. What does the bear represent? The Medes and Persians. Then we have a leopard, and that represents what? The kingdom of Greece. Then we have a dragon beast, which represents what kingdom? Rome. And then that dragon beast sprouts ten horns. And what do the ten horns represent? Rome in a divided state. And then among the ten horns rises what? A little horn. And what does the little horn represent? It is a new Rome. It is papal Rome. And how long does the little horn rule? 
time times and the dividing of time which is 1260 what? years applying the year day principle. And then in Daniel 7 after the little horn rules for 1260 years we have this heavenly scene of judgment where the ancient of days goes and he sits and it says that the judgment is set and the books are what? Open. Is that after 1798? Absolutely after 1798. But then we find that coming on the clouds of heaven to where the ancient of days entered and by the way it doesn't say he came on the clouds of heaven to the earth. That was a fundamental mistake of the Millerites. You know the clouds of heaven, Jesus coming, that's the second coming. No, Daniel 7 says that he came on the clouds to the ancient of days. Where does the ancient of days live? Since 1844 he is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So Jesus goes into the most holy place and there he, has, he is given his kingdom. The purpose of the judgment is for Jesus to receive his kingdom. Now the question is what is the kingdom? Folks the kingdom has nothing to do with territory. The kingdom has everything to do with what persons belong to the kingdom of Jesus Christ. The purpose of the judgment is to determine who is a true genuine follower of Jesus Christ. Who has truly accepted Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. That's the purpose of the heavenly judgment. And when Jesus has judged the case of all of those who profess Jesus Christ, then his kingdom will be made up because it will have been revealed who are members of his kingdom. Now you say why do we need this judgment if God knows everything? The purpose of the judgment is not to inform God. The purpose of the judgment is to reveal before the universe that God was right in the way that he dealt with those who professed the name of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you are there true and counterfeit believers in the church? Did Jesus say that there were wheat and tares in the church? Absolutely. Does the gospel net gather good and bad fish? Absolutely. Were there wise and foolish virgins in the church? Yes. Was the wedding hall filled with guests? Yes. But there were some that did not have the robe. They were in the books but they did not have the robe. Are there those who say Lord, Lord but their life denies Lord, Lord? Absolutely. Are there even ministers who claim to be ministers of righteousness but are not? Absolutely. Are there those in the church that have a form of godliness but lack the power of godliness? Are there those who have been forgiven a huge debt by Jesus that then refuse to to let that forgiveness flow through them to others to forgive others. By the way for those who say that forgiveness can cannot be revoked just read Matthew chapter 18. This individual that was forgiven much then he goes out and he grabs somebody by the neck that owed him a pittance and he started shaking him and saying pay me and this man said, well give me time and I'll pay you. No, no time. Pay me now. And he has him thrown in prison. Ha! Huh. When the king heard that he called him in and he revoked his forgiveness. So don't you tell me that forgiveness can not be revoked when the, when the cases are examined and it's discovered that those who claimed Jesus as Savior and Lord did not really embrace Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. What else do we find in the most holy place of the sanctuary? The Ten Commandments. Should that be part of the preaching of the Seventh-day Adventist Church? What is found in the center of the Ten Commandments? The Sabbath. And by the way, the Sabbath is highlighted in the most holy place. You say, how is it highlighted? Because God placed in the Ark of the Covenant two things related to the Sabbath. The first is in the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But he also placed in the ark a pot of manna. 
So the Sabbath is doubly highlighted. And I believe that's the reason why Ellen White saw the Sabbath commandment with a halo around it. It's enhanced. It's highlighted. And if you remember, when God rained the manna from heaven, He gave that as a test to Israel to see if they would walk in His law. Which means that in the Ark of the Covenant you have the law, you have the Sabbath, and the Sabbath as a test whether God's people will walk in God's law or not. But another lesson of the manna was healthful living. God gave the manna to show that we should live healthy, vegetarian, vegan <laughs> lifestyle. And not only we should also sleep enough, and we should drink enough of the right things, of course. <laughs> and that we should exercise. So in the Ark of the Covenant the manna highlights the Sabbath, but it also teaches healthful living. And then of course you have the idea of the judgment in the most holy place. In fact the judgment of Israel took place in the most holy place. So you have the investigative judgment in the most holy place. You also have in the most holy place the idea that the dead are dead. You say now where do you find that? Well I'll tell you briefly there was also a rod in the Ark of the Covenant. And that rod sprouted life. That rod represented Jesus who has life in himself. Because I live, Jesus said, you shall live what? Also. There's something else in the most holy place that reveals that people are dead until the resurrection. That there's no immortal soul that goes to heaven or to hell when you die. You say, what is that? Well, if the judgment began in 1844, at a certain point in history, and the first ones to be judged were those who first lived upon the earth. It must mean that Adam, who was judged first because he was the first being created, Adam, who was judged first in 1844, he couldn't be in heaven. How could he be in heaven before he was judged? Are you with me? So in other words, the idea that the judgment begins at a certain point of time indicates that people did not go to heaven or to hell when they died because they would not be taken to heaven or they would not be sent to hell before they were what? Before they were judged. Now let me ask you, are these all the distinctive beliefs of the Adventist church? Are those the points of contention with the Christian world? The commandments, the Sabbath, healthful living, the state of the dead? the investigative judgment? Absolutely! These are the doctrines that are contended in the Christian world and it are rejected to a great degree in the Christian world and the reason why is because the Christian world has not followed Jesus Christ into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary which is present truth. Amen. Now we need to go to Revelation 13 and 14 quickly. You see in Daniel chapter 7 we have the judgment as a heavenly scene. In other words what you see in Daniel 7 about the judgment is taking place in heaven. But of course it wouldn't do any good for this judgment to play, take place in heaven if nobody knew about it on earth. So in Revelation 14 we have the same judgment but the emphasis is the announcement of that judgment on earth. Go with me to Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 2. It's referring clearly to Daniel chapter 7. It says here, Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth was like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. What do those beasts bring to mind? Daniel 7. Is that correct? So notice you have the same four beasts. You have a lion, you have a bear, you have a leopard, and you have a dragon. And Revelation 12 says that that dragon has ten horns. And then the ten horned dragon gives its seat, its authority, and its power to the beast. And the beast rules for 42 months or 1260 years. Do we have the same time frame in Revelation 13 as we have in Daniel 7? Yes. 
absolutely but now I want you to notice in chapter 14 what transpires after these powers rule Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7 Revelation chapter 14 and verses 6 and 7 right after talking about the lion, the bear, the leopard, the dragon the ten horns on the dragon and then the beast that rules for 1260 years we have an earthly announcement of a very important event then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue and people saying with a loud voice fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment will come thank you very much you're with me it doesn't say for the hour of his judgment will come it says the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth the sea and the springs of water now here's my question does the judgment begin while the gospel is being preached? <laughs> of course this angel is seen proclaiming the everlasting gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue and people and the angel says fear God and give glory to him for the hour of judgment has come so the judgment begins while the gospel is being preached so does the judgment begin before probation closes? it most certainly does after these powers rule and immediately afterwards what do we have? the warning in Revelation 14 that the hour of God's judgment has what? the hour of God's judgment has begun see this isn't rocket science all you have to do is, is follow the logical sequence of prophecy it's called historicism it's, it's the main method that is used to interpret, a pro, interpret prophecy in the Adventist church and if I dare say there are those in the Adventist church that are starting to fiddle with this method and they're starting to project portions of revelation purely to the future they're on dangerous ground now do you know that the three angels message contains the same things as the most holy place? let me just share it with you if you look at the expression fear God almost invariably in the Old Testament it's used in connection with keeping God's commandments Ecclesiastes chapter 12 says fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man furthermore the third angel's message says here are they who keep what? the commandments of God do the three angels message bring the commandments to you? how about the Sabbath? Hmm. worship him who created the heavens, the earth, the seas and the fountains of waters the first angel's message brings to view the Sabbath is that a most holy place teaching? absolutely does, do the three angels messages bring to view the idea that the Sabbath will be a test? yes because the test will be over the mark of the beast or what? or the seal of God those are in the three angels messages do the three angels messages bring to view the hour of God's judgment? is that in the most holy place? it most certainly is how about the state of the dead? is the state of the dead in the three angels message? of course if the hour of God's judgment begins at a certain point then people did not go to heaven or to hell when they died Amen. do the three angels message have the idea of health reform? yes because the first angels message says fear God and give glory to him and the apostle Paul says therefore glorify God with your body and with your spirit which are God's if therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do do all to what? to the glory of God in other words the three angels message are the earthly proclamation of the message of the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary this is present truth and it worries me when I see Adventist churches changing their names to Adventist Community Church or Adventist Fellowship like we want to get rid of the distinctiveness of the Adventist Church we should be, we should be proclaiming this from the rooftops 
that we are Seventh-day Adventists. And then we must explain people what that means. But the most holy place has another message which has been greatly ignored by the Christian world and even by Adventists. You see before the Day of Atonement which is the message of the most holy place you have the Feast of Trumpets which announced the coming Day of Atonement and the need to prepare. You know sometimes we've emphasized so much what Jesus does in heaven that we forget what the people did outside the sanctuary as the priest was working inside. What were the people doing outside? Oh they were jumping and they were speaking in tongues and they were shouting and they were laughing in the spirit? No! What were they doing? They were afflicting their soul and they were fasting and they gathered around their, the sanctuary because their minds had to be in the sanctuary because once the Day of Atonement closed that was it. He, was his, he who was filthy was still filthy and he who was holy was still holy. You see as Jesus cleanses the sanctuary in heaven he does a parallel work of cleansing the temple of the soul on earth. I want to read Joel chapter 2. Of course the clock is our greatest enemy. <laughs> Joel 2 verses 10 and 11. If you read the first nine verses it's describing the second coming of Christ. And the climax is in verse 10 and verse 11 asks a question. Notice what it says, the earth quakes before them. This is an army that has invaded the earth. The heavens tremble, the sun and moon grow dark, and the stars diminish their brightness. The Lord gives voice before His army, for His camp is very great, for strong is the one who executes His word. And now notice, for the day of the Lord is great and very terrible, and who can endure it? So it's describing the second time coming and it says who can endure the day of Christ coming? The answer is in the very next verse. And I'm only going to read verses 12 and 13 and then I'm going to jump down to verses 15 to 17 because of the time. It says in verse 12, now therefore because the day of His wrath is going to be so great and terrible who is going to be able to stand? God says beforehand, now therefore says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping and with mourning. Is that what we're supposed to be doing now? Yes! Well, it's not time for celebration. The time for celebration is tabernacles in heaven. Now that doesn't mean that we can't celebrate what Jesus did on the cross and we can't experience salvation like, like Shelley told us this afternoon. We can have the joy of salvation. We can even say that Christ has saved us by His grace. It doesn't mean that we can't have joy, but it does mean that we're doing soul searching. And it continues saying, so rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. That's repentance. Return to the Lord your God for He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and He relents from doing harm. And then you have a reference to the Feast of Trumpets. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the people. Sanctify the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and nursing babes. Let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not give your heritage to reproach that the nation should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? That's the spirit of the Day of Atonement on earth. Because Jesus is not going to cleanse anything there that has not been cleansed here. You know that question, that you find in Joel chapter 2 and verse 11 is repeated in Revelation. After describing the second coming signs in the moon and the stars and a great earthquake and so on, it says in Revelation 6 verse 17 at the conclusion of this passage, for the great day of His wrath has come. And who shall be able to stand? Is that the same question we notice in Joel? Absolutely. Do you know where the answer comes? In the very next chapter. There are 144,000 which represents the living saints when Jesus comes. They follow the Lamb wherever He goes. 
They have the name of their father written in their foreheads. They are virgins. Which means that they have not become defiled with the apostate women, the, the fallen churches. They are without spot before the throne of God. In other words, those who have been in the sanctuary with Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit had over, have overcome sin in their lives. You know I have people say, well Pastor Bohr, nobody's perfect. In fact they say, are you perfect? And when I, and I answer, no I'm not perfect. But the possibility of perfection does not depend on whether I'm perfect or not, it depends on whether God is able or not. Amen. Some people say you can never overcome sin before Jesus comes. The flesh is too strong. So you're saying that the flesh is stronger than God. Never. The world is too powerful. So you're saying the world is more powerful than God. The devil is more powerful. You're saying that the devil is more powerful than God. Oh, my genes <laughs> made me do it. So your genes are more powerful than God. The environment I grew up in made me do it. So you're saying that your environment is more powerful than God. See when you say that it is not possible to reach perfection, you're not really saying that man is weak, you're saying that God is not strong. You know that text in the Bible that says, I can do almost all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> okay, you didn't like that, okay? How about, uh, I can do some things through Christ who strengthens me. My Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And by the way, there are no parentheses. He doesn't say, I can do all things except overcome sin through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> Allow me to read you a couple of statements from Ellen White. From the book Maranatha, page 249, she says, From the Holy of Holies, there goes on the grand work of instruction. God is trying to instruct us from the Holy of Holies. She says, the angels of God are communicating to men. Christ officiates in the sanctuary. We do not follow him into the sanctuary as we should. Christ and his angels work in the hearts of the children of men. The church above united with the church below is warring the good warfare upon the earth. There must be a purifying of the soul here upon the earth in harmony with Christ's cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. In the devotional book, The Upward Look, page 344, she says this, Satan is constantly alluring away from faithfulness and thoroughness in the essential works of preparedness for the great event that will try every man's soul. The work in the heavenly sanctuary is going forward. Jesus is cleansing the sanctuary. The work on earth corresponds with the work in heaven. Do you see that? The work on earth corresponds with the work in heaven. The heavenly angels are at work constantly to draw man, the living agent, to look to Jesus, to contemplate and meditate upon Jesus that he may, in viewing the perfection of Christ, be impressed with the imperfections of his own character. And then she says, this is the burden of the message for this time. In other words, this is present truth. Well, most of the Christian world, uh, you know, follows what the bumper sticker says, I'm not perfect, just forgiven. <laughs> well, God wants you to be forgiven, but He wants more than forgiveness. He wants to pour out His power to overcome. He doesn't want us to have a frustrated Christian walk where we just all constantly coming, forgive, forgive, forgive. He will forgive if we're sincere and we love the Lord. But Jesus wants us to have victory over sin. Amen. You see this is the one doctrine that distinguishes Seventh-day Adventists from every other church. It's no coincidence that shortly after 1844 our pioneers discovered all the distinctive truths of the Adventist church. Because once you enter the most holy place, you see the ark and you know that the law is there. So it wasn't done away with at the cross. And once you examine the law, you see the Sabbath is there. And once you're in the most holy place, you say that's where the judgment took place. And once you see the pot of man, you see God gave that to Israel for healthful living and it highlights the Sabbath. And once you believe that the judgment began at a certain point, the dead are dead until the resurrection, until after they're judged. 
All of the distinctive truths of the Adventist church are found in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. That is present truth. And Ellen White has said in early writings page 256, she says about the three angels messages which are the earthly announcement of the heavenly event, these messages were represented to me as an anchor to the people of God. Those who understand and receive them will be kept from being swept away by the many delusions of Satan. Is the final controversy going to be over God's law? Is it going to be over the Sabbath? Is spiritualism going to be involved? Which is a wrong concept of the state of the dead. Are you understanding that the distinctive truths of the Adventist church are the issue in the end time conflict? Do we need to warn the world about this? This is what we need to be warning the world about. Yes, we need to teach people to follow Jesus. We don't start with people in the most holy place. We need to take them first of all to the camp. Jesus lived his life for you. We need to take him to a court. Jesus died the death for you. Then we need to take him to the holy place and say, now you can come to Jesus and if you're repentant and you confess your sins and you trust in the merits of Jesus, Jesus will take his life and he'll take his death and he'll put them to your account and you'll be covered by the blood in the sanctuary. But we need to lead them one step further and reveal to them the truths of the most holy place. The idea that through the power of God sin can be overcome because sin is not more powerful than God. Amen. This is what Elder Wilson was calling us to do. Yes. This is what makes our church special and gives us the reason for our existence. And woe to us if we should think that we need to preach what everybody else is preaching and we need to grow churches the way everybody else grows churches. The truth will fill the church with those who are sincere and loving. And that's the way we should...